Would you like to accelerate your career and reach your full potential in just minutes a day? Welcome to the LeadX Show with New York Times bestselling author and Inc. 500 entrepreneur, Kevin Cruz. How can you be a little more awesome? And can a heavyweight boxer really be a vegan? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Kevin Cruz here. And in just a minute, we're going to talk about bouncing back from failure and resilience. This is a different kind of interview for us, and I'm so excited. But first, congratulations to you on being a lifelong learner and proactive with your career. You turn on the LeadX show as you tie your sneakers and head out for that morning jog, or maybe you're turning on the LeadX show and you turn on your car for your morning commute. Either way, whenever you listen, you know LeadX will help you to stand out and get ahead. Tell your friends at work, Lead X is the smartest way to start your day. Now, today's one minute career tip is LinkedIn 500. You need to have over 500 connections on LinkedIn. Why? Well, I was having lunch recently with a bunch of recruiters, these headhunters, and they all agreed LinkedIn is the first place they go to check someone out, like for a job. And when they pull up your profile, they immediately look at your picture, they read your name, but then they look at the little number that's next to the city name. Now that's the number of people that you're connected to on LinkedIn. Now, if you have over 500 connections, it just appears as 500 plus. So for example, I have 16,000 direct connections on LinkedIn, but to the public, it still just shows 500 plus. But if you have less than 500 connections, it'll be the actual number like 136. Now all these recruiters, and don't shoot the messenger, I'm just reporting what they told me, they said if they see a number less than 500, they're thinking loser. 500 or more, they're thinking winner. Because in their mind, it's so easy to get over 500 connections. If you don't have them, it means you're just not a player in your industry. You're not out there, you know, moving and shaking. You're not meeting people. You're not making a mark. So now if all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, I got to get to over 500. It's not that hard. Just reach out to all of your colleagues, all of your former colleagues, you know, people you went to college with or to school with, your friends, your family members, people at church. And if you run out of those people, start reading some of those articles and posts that you see in your feed on LinkedIn and just click like and then send a message to the author and say, hey, really like that article. Here's why I liked it. And by the way, I'd like to connect with you. And you'll have over 500 connections in no time. Now, before I introduce our guest, finally, big thanks to all of you who have subscribed to the LeadX show on iTunes and left a rating and short review. It only takes a minute, but it's the best favor you can do for me. Now, our guest today is not our normal company CEO or business author. He's a man that came to my attention a few years ago, and I've been fascinated by him, inspired by him ever since. He is a champion heavyweight boxer who also happens to be a vegan. He lands punches in the ring and punchlines in comedy clubs as a stand-up comic. He travels around the country as a keynote speaker, inspiring audiences with his life story and teaching principles like goal setting and resilience. And this is amazing. Our guest, he just won his fifth Golden Gloves National Championship three days ago. <laughs> it's my pleasure to welcome, and this is his legal name, Cam F. Awesome. Cam, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. And uh, congrats on the recent win. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, I wish it was number five, but it is only f number four, uh, four <laughs> Golden Glove National Championships. But there is five USA Boxing National Championships. Five USA Boxing National Championships, four Golden Gloves. Yeah. Awesome. I, I'm surprised you're even up and around and doing um, these interviews. I think you'd just be resting, taking this week off. Oh no! I, I this this is the the week to strike. This is uh, <laughs> this has been all a part of the plan, and, and weirdly, it's been working out. <laughs> I love this. So now you've got a fascinating story, Cam. So take us back to the beginning. Like as a kid, you were named Lenroy Thompson, and you know you weren't uh, always the best of athletes. So take us back to your childhood and how you got into boxing to begin with. Well, I, I, I'll go back to the very beginning. When I was born, I was Lenroy Cameron Thompson Jr., and I was named after my father. And they would – everyone called me Cameron by my middle name, uh, so not to get my father and I confused. Why they didn't just call me Junior, I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> but I would always go by Cameron, and I wasn't the coolest kid in school, and I wasn't very social. It's social anxiety before that was even a thing. I would just stay home and play video games and eat, and I gained a lot of weight and was very socially awkward, but at – Around 16, 
I decided I, I want to lose weight and try to get a date for prom. Hey, we all need goals, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I never made any teams in, in high school or junior high. So I knew I couldn't try out for like a school sport, but there was a free boxing gym down the block. Uh, I was just a couple miles away from my house growing up in Long Island, New York. And uh, I just I signed up for the boxing gym at about 16. And I, I realized that I would be a little bit outside of my comfort zone because I'd never really worked out, never hit the weights and uh, wasn't very masculine, like what people would think a boxer would be. Right. And I went with just the intentions of working out. I didn't want to punch anyone. I definitely didn't want to get punched <laughs> myself. And after going there day after day, I, I lost the weight. And one day they were like, hey, do you want to spar? And I remember saying, oh, no, my mom wouldn't be okay with that. <laughs> well, what every future champion boxer says, my mom wouldn't be too cool with that. <laughs> yeah. Everyone laughed and I was embarrassed. So I decided I would spar. And uh, I took a very unique way of looking at boxing. I didn't really work with a coach because I had no intentions of boxing. I just followed what I saw everyone else do. But if I saw someone hitting the heavy bag and they were hitting it in like, you know, to the body, I'm like, well, you want to punch mostly to the head. They're doing that wrong. And I would see someone hit the double end bag and say, okay, that's for reflexes. Then I would see someone hit the speed bag and I couldn't figure out why anyone would hit the speed bag. It looks cool, but it's very ineffective. Mm. So I decided I would never hit the speed bag. And to this day, I, I didn't do it. But wow. taking a logical approach to boxing led me to becoming number one in the country a lot faster than most boxers. Well, once you started boxing, I mean, you moved up quickly and, and surprised people. And by you know 2012, you had already gotten so many regional titles and everything that people were comparing you. And, and you're, you're, you are a heavyweight. You know, they're talking about Joe Lewis and Sonny Liston and Cassius Clay. I mean, the biggest names in boxing. You know, I'm curious, like, you know, what was like that when you started to hear that chatter? Because 2012 Olympics were coming up, right? Yeah, I, I actually I started boxing in 2007, and within a year I qualified for the 2008 Olympic trials, and I lost. I wasn't very experienced, but I bounced back and won nationals in 2008, 2009, 2010, and then 2011, and qualified for the 2012 Olympic trials. And I started hearing I was being compared to these to these great people, and I, I was overly confident in my head to where I knew if I did everything I was supposed to, no one could beat me. And uh, after going to 2012 Olympic trials and winning. I did a lot of traveling. I was leaving the country a lot. And I was the first boxer to ever be suspended and kicked off the Olympic team for not filling out paperwork. Mm. What do you mean by that? You saw the United States Anti-Doping Agency. Yeah. They conduct testings. You have to tell them where you're going to be on the hour, every hour, 365 days a year. So if I left town, I had to tell them where I was going. If I was going to you know, a, a football game and I wouldn't have my phone on me. I would have to tell them where my seats are, where I'm going, what time I'll be back. And I did not inform them three times within 18 months. Wow. Basically, I have to send them an email and tell them I'm going here. This is the hotel. This is the hotel room I'll be in yeah. for these random drug tests. And it wasn't a real offense, but it was right after Lance Armstrong yeah. went on Oprah and they cracked down and made an example out of some athletes. So how old were you at the time? I was... 24, 23, 24. Wow. So you go from, you know, thinking, you know, this, this great future and that you're going to go fight in the Olympics. And all of a sudden, you know, they say, Hey, you didn't tell us the third time, you know, your paperwork wasn't filled out right. You're, you're completely off. So what was that like? How did you handle that? I knew I couldn't get suspended because I mean, you know, a couple of times I left to go fight in a competition, you have to be drug tested for it to compete in. Right. So I was just going to let them know that and send them the paperwork. So I went to the arbitration in Colorado Springs, flew out from LA. And after I was suspended, my sponsors in LA called me immediately and said, don't bother coming back. Wow. Let them know where to mail all my stuff. So I didn't have a place to live. I went back and crashed at a, a friend's house in Kansas City until I could get back on my feet. It was a pretty bad year for me. I got to learn a lot about myself. That's what I wanted to explore this part of your career, because it's like you thought like the path forward is so certain. And, and a lot of us, we get confident and confidence is good, right? But you didn't have a plan B. So I can imagine it was like your world was crashing down when all of a sudden it's like, hey, don't come back to L.A. You've got no place to live. You're not going to the Olympics. That must have been tough. Oh, yeah, it was tough to wrap my head around. And the other part, which not a lot of people think of, is 
you know, I was getting a lot of press, a lot of TV time interviews and, and in the newspaper every week. And how's my training going? I would go to Walmart or grocery store and people would recognize me and it was great. And those same people after I went back to Kansas City would recognize me after I was suspended and they said, hey, Cam, are you ready for the Olympics? And it was embarrassing having to explain that story to everyone. And, you know, if you do try to explain that to someone off the bat, as soon as you mention USADA, they look at you like, oh, mm. you got caught right. doping. And ESPN released an article as soon as it happened, said uh, Lenroy Thompson failed to meet drug test requirements. Now, if you read the article, you would see that USADA said they had no suspicions that I was doping of any kind, but it was a paperwork error on my part. And people just read the captions. Right. So everyone thought I was doping or I was, right. I was smoking weed or I was doing right. drugs. And so that was super embarrassing. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, because this is like, again, your your friends or extended family, everything. This is all of a sudden, you know, they're not, they don't understand the deals. They, they see this report on ESPN. And, you know, it's even your like your brand and reputation. I re should say reputation more than your brand, which, you know, this is going to stick, you know, uh, as well. So you said it was it was a tough year right after that. Yeah, it was very, very difficult on me. Um, I'd gained a lot of weight. I didn't want to go to the gym. I didn't want to work out. I just, just stayed home and I drank and I got into my feelings. I had a probably a, a six month pity party. Mm. How'd you break out of it? I actually lost a bet and it was Manny Pacquiao versus Timothy Bradley and the loser <laughs> had to be vegan for 28 days. And I, I lost, I lost a bet, which I, I shouldn't have. And it was the engine Two 28 day challenge and the diet entailed sobriety. So I had to be sober for the first time. Mm for 28 days and kind of got out of my funk and I lost a little bit of weight doing, I lost 32 pounds in the 28 days. Jeez. I hated it. The first two weeks were so bad. The third week was also bad, but like the last couple of days I was like, man, I'm starting to feel good. I'm starting to get an energy boost. I'm eating cleaner. I'm living better. I wish I could do this for longer. And I was like, oh, wait, I can. <laughs> I don't want to be a vegan because, you know, th those people aren't cool. So I was like, I'll just do it for a little bit longer. And it's been five years now and I'm, I'm, I'm still vegan. After losing the weight, I kind of got motivated and out of my funk. Uh, I decided to pursue boxing again, partly because I, I didn't have a backup plan. Right. I was so sure that I wasn't going to lose that I didn't need a backup plan. I ended up losing to paperwork. Yeah. Yeah. So you haven't, <laughs> you've talked about how, you know, you, you got out of your funk and, um, start, you know, started, uh, gave up alcohol, became a vegan. You haven't actually gotten to the part where you're no longer Lenroy Thompson. Yeah. <laughs> uh, after it was, I was kind of embarrassed to, I, I, I didn't know if I wanted to be the guy who got suspended off the team and, and no longer boxed or the guy who's back in boxing that was suspended mm -hmm. off the team. I decided I was going to box again, but I was going to do it in a different way. I was going to live cleaner. I was going to be more of a positive person. I was going to do anything I set my mind to, I decided I would accomplish. And with that new change of attitude, I wanted to change my name from Legally Lenroy to Cameron. And I just actually wanted to change it to Cam. And I figured if I'm going to do that, I could change my last name too. <laughs> and I thought of all the different possibilities of, of what my last name could be. And I came up with awesome. And to this day, I haven't thought of a better last name. <laughs> so Cam, let, I, now I'm just curious. You, when you go to change your name, what is that a form at a courthouse? You got to stand before a judge. How do you do it? Actually, yeah, you fill out your, you, you pay the, it was like $178 and then you have to put your name in the newspaper for three consecutive weeks saying, my name is Lenroy Thompson. I want to change it to Cam F. Awesome. And <laughs> that's because I guess it's an old law because that's, I guess, to show I'm not hiding right. from someone. I did it for one week and I was like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not paying like $9 to put right. my name in the penny savers. So I went to go see the judge. After you do it, you're supposed to see the judge. So I booked my appointment early to see the judge and she asked me if I like well, as soon as I walked in the courtroom, I got there early. I'm like wearing a suit because I thought it was like going to be a big deal. Right. Uh, I've watched Judge Judy before. I know what to expect. <laughs> and like I walk in, the judge stopped what was going on. She says, are you Mr. Thompson? I was like, yes, ma'am. And she says, uh, we've been waiting for you. <laughs> so they finished up and she the first question she asked was uh, she's like, I, I'm not here to tell you what to do, but are you sure you would like to change your last name to awesome? Do you know that there may be negative consequences that come with that? And I was like, uh, actually, Your Honor, it is your job to judge. And <laughs> if I don't like 
my name. I'll pay another $178 and change it again. <laughs> and she's like, all right. And I was like, are you going to hit your gavel? She's like, oh, I don't, I don't even have my gavel on me. That is funny. That was a little anticlimactic because <laughs> I pictured, the, you know, she banged the gavel and said, I'll allow it or whatever. Yeah, I would think it'd be didn't. some ceremony like <laughs> announcing your new name and smacking the gavel and everybody cheering or something. But I guess it didn't work that way. No, it was just like six of us in the room. It was a little more <laughs> awkward than I thought it would be. That's funny. Um, I also am curious about like, uh, I want to ask you a couple of the questions about being a vegan because, so I say I'm a vegan 90% of the time. The other 10%, I'm like Super Bowl party. You know, I'm completely opposite yeah. of, of a vegan and my parents are vegan. And so, you know, I think the question that people get uh, a lot who are vegan is they'll, you know, they'll say, especially though, like I even have the question, heavyweight boxer, you know, it, how are you getting enough protein? That's what everybody asks. Yeah, I, I get that's that's the most popular question I, I get asked. I don't count protein. I don't believe you need to. I think if you eat clean, you'll be able to get enough protein in. The only reason why there are supplements, like your body, it's designed so well that if you're taking in the right food, you should be able to hit every nutritional need your body needs. But what happens is someone will eat like a tub of ice cream and be like, oh, I don't have any more room left for right. protein. And then they'd have like a hundred gram protein shake where they're just passing like 90 grams out of their body because their body can't process that much all at once. Because I, I think a lot of marketing has tricked and fooled people into thinking that they need all the protein. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize that there is protein in vegetables and things. They don't even know they can get oh. it there. And you think about like an elephant that eats, you know, vegetation, yeah. uh, you know, gets a lot of protein. Or a gorilla. Way. Or a gorilla. Yeah. Yeah. People don't really think that. But there's this connection between masculinity and meat. Yeah that people have, not just here in America, but everywhere. They're like, all right, men eat meat and fighters eat meat. And I don't really think you need to. Yeah. And for those who are, you know, athletes or whatever, and kind of still wondering if they're getting enough. I mean, even if you're vegan, you know, there are, there are protein shakes that you can take that are not whey protein. You can get, uh, there's pea protein and hemp and other uh, things. Garden of Life, they make all vegan supplements, but most people... Like I think you need supplements if you are on my level or Michael Phelps who's burning like 5,000 calories a workout. Those are the people that need supplements. The person who goes on a 17-minute walk on their lunch break <laughs> right. that thinks they need to drink a 2,000-calorie smoothie after they do that is hurting themselves more than they would be if they were just not even to take that walk. You're not depleting your body with – your short workouts. You don't need to consume that many supplements. Cam, you said like, it's been like five years and part of it was just like, you just felt like you just feel better, you know, as a, as a vegan. Um, and so now that it's been this many years, is it still like, yeah, this is just, it's easy and I understand how to do it and all the rest. Or do you still yourself fight like cravings for certain things or like your body just doesn't want it? Oh, uh, I crave cheese. <laughs> Five years later, I don't remember what cheese tastes like, but I do remember I miss it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I found that I'm going to be vegan for the rest of my life because I have a very unhealthy relationship with food. Mm. If I could, I will eat anything that's convenient and fast. Yeah. I'll pull into a drive through every day and I'll just say, this is the last day. I'm not usually going to do this. I know myself and I know I love food. But if I limit myself to what I can eat and I stick to plant-based foods – I can't stop off at drive throughs The only fast food I can really eat is Chipotle because they have the sofritas. Right. Uh, and that's like vegan tofu. And shout out to them because they sponsor me. And <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it limits me to what I can eat and it, it helps me stay on weight. That makes sense. So, you know, back to your career path, we were talking about the disappointment of, of 2012, but actually led, you know, to your rebirth, the new name and the, and the new lifestyle. What I called my afterbirth day. That's great. I threw a party, after birthday party. I love that. And, and, and I love this concept of like, literally, I mean, how many people would normally think like, okay, I can choose an after birth party. I can reinvent myself. I can, you know, be reborn on my own terms. And that's literally what you did down to your name. Yeah. I, and I actually changed my name legally on my half birthday just so I can justify celebrating both. Wow. That's great. Spread them apart. <laughs> yeah. So you recommitted to your boxing career with, you know, looking forward to at the time, the 2016 Olympics. So, 
tell me about that and what happened in 2016. During the year off, after I kind of did the the vegan thing and I was getting back into it, I went to open my comedy nights because it was always free. And I decided I wanted to try to do an open mic. And I did a few open mics and I started doing comedy shows. And when I got back into boxing, if I would have a fight in Dallas, I would call up the Dallas Comedy House and say, <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm coming in. You don't have to pay for my travel or my stay, but I want a show on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. I'll do it for minimum pay. I was just doing it for, for the experience. Yeah. And I decided that my backup plan from boxing would be comedy. And now in hindsight, that's ridiculous because it's the only thing <laughs> less likely than being successful in boxing. But I went to an open mic one night and I ran into a guy. He said, hey, you were talking about being a speaker on stage. Can I ask you, uh, what do you make in speaking? And I was like, oh, you can't make money speaking. He says, you can make money speaking. I was like, no, you can't. He's like, I'm a speaker. And <laughs> it's actually Devin Henderson. He's also a magician. And I was like, hey, if that's true, can I take you to coffee? Can we have coffee tomorrow? And I asked him like a million questions and he introduced me to, to a few people in NSA and yeah. I got on the path of speaking that way. So I would go to high schools and I would take over the gym class for an entire week. I would give a speech every class and teach boxing. And that way I would work on my delivery. So as I was traveling with boxing, I was going to different schools in different cities and I would fight at night and speak at schools during the day and do comedy shows late, late at night. It's amazing. And my backup plan was my, my plan now in about 2014 was to go to the Olympics in 2016, get a medal, don't get a medal, no matter what, I'd be an Olympian and use that platform to build a successful speaking career. And uh, won nationals in 2013, 14, 15, 16, uh, won the Olympic trials in 2016, and lost an international competition. So I didn't qualify f for the actual Rio Games. So I won the Olympic trials, but you do have to qualify internationally. And I lost on a split in the finals in an international competition. So Yeah, and I know you're not one to make excuses, but there was some questions about the uh, the impartiality of the judges in that fight, too. Yeah, yeah, that's always a part of the game. But, you know, it's a subjective scoring system. And I, of course, put in the work. So I always think I deserve to win. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I'm always going to be a little biased on that side. But I decided I, I didn't want to take any time off after 2016, after I fell short, because I realized what a slump I fell into mm. in 2012. And granted, it feels good, you know, having that pressure off your shoulders and like, having your pity party and, and crying all that out of you. But if you if you fall down, it takes so much energy to climb back up. So I decided I would keep the ball rolling. Uh, I lost that fight July 4th, 2016. July 5th, I decided I was going to pursue speaking full-time and stop boxing. After a few months, I realized that I would be an athlete speaker. And if I'm not an athlete, I can't really be an athlete speaker. So I would just box enough to maintain my my status as number one boxer in the country yeah. and use that platform uh, to build a speaking career. In December, I fought at nationals and uh, I won nationals again just to be able to put on my resume that I'm the current number one boxer in the country. And now I'm just fighting in any tournaments just to, to remain number one. The Golden Glove Nationals Championships, I won that because I knew if I won National Golden Glove Championships, I would be eligible for their scholarship to pay my way to Influence 17. And I would get a lot of free press and TV time from doing interviews and articles right. about winning my fourth National Golden Glove Championship. And I would use that as a platform to, you know, book more speaking gigs and to promote my podcast and get on other people's podcasts. And it's obviously working. You know, and it's funny, Kim, because the way you just described this, it's as if it's the most natural thing in the world. Like, well, yeah, I'll just continue to be the number one boxer and just fight and everything while working on my speaking career. And oh, yeah, my passion to do stand up comedy. Like, <laughs> There's a lot of paths to success. And I don't know that anybody has, has chosen this path. And it's clearly uh, like is it clearly working for you. Yeah, there's there's the tough parts. And, and you may be able to relate to this when you're having a bad day. Because I'm I'm big on social media now, and I'm continuing to build a bigger following, and I'm trying to tweet at the right times and be relevant, and I'm trying to be authentic, but it's almost impossible to be authentic and politically correct at the same time. <laughs> so you're you're gonna upset a few people with some posts, but right? I sometimes lose 20 followers a day on Twitter, but then I would gain 30 followers that same day. So I'm building a genuine strong following, and I feel like that is part of the first step. But when you're posting motivational things. When you're in a bad mood, right, 
hurt so much. Yeah. Well, and, and you're, you're doing a better job than I am because, you know, I, um, I don't do a ton on social media, but like, I'm trying to do more of like the behind the scenes with Snapchat stories, Instagram stories. And yet like I, yesterday, for example, I did not post anything, any videos, anything, because I was in a really foul mood <laughs> and, yeah. you know, people better than me will just say, oh, I'll just turn it on for the camera, turn it on for the audience, or I'll, you know, know that this is part of marketing, got to do it. And if I am just in a foul mood, I just, I have a hard time putting myself out there on social media. It's like stabbing yourself in the face. It's like, <laughs> I don't like it, but I think that where we are today, if we were to go back like 1997 and- you know, if someone were to tell you in 1997, listen, you need to get on this whole internet train and get on the online marketing and the social right. media, because in, t- in about 10 years, there's something called MySpace. It's going to get really big. <laughs> Trust me. That's going to be seem like a crazy person. But what I believe right now in the direction that society is going, I believe that we're going to be less PC. We're going to be less conservative. And the young professionals of today are going to be those CEOs in right. 20 years. And those are going to be the people who are hiring. So right now, as much as I need to build a career, because I'm a struggling artist, I'm a struggling athlete, I'm a struggling speaker, as much as I would like to appeal to the, you know, the the 60-year-old white men who are running these companies, I know that in 20 years, the young professionals, that's who I will be making a strong living off of. And and this is really smart because, you know, the old saying, you dig your well before you're thirsty. And that's like, this is the audience of this show. It's that millennial generation. Now, that's a pretty big range, you know, from, I don't know, 20-ish to to 35. But you're right. It's like connecting with that group now who they're not in power now. But I mean, especially you, you're a lot younger than I am. So they're going to be in power for decades when, when you know, you're also going to, you know, be looking to, uh, to monetize that attention, as they say. So, you know, I wanted to sneak in another question, Cam, because with all the crazy stuff you got going on in your life, and, and you're obviously very, a very humble speaker and comic and, and athlete, you know, how are you keeping it all together? You, I know you speak on the power of habits. What have been some habits that have helped you in the past or that you're even using today? The biggest thing that I had to do was I had to acknowledge what my habits were because I think a lot of other people think this way, but they don't realize they do. They think that what they're doing is right and it is not a habit. I have so many habits. I didn't think they were habits. I just thought, well, this is the way I do things because that's the way that works. I decided I would have to I have to acknowledge what all my habits are, whether they're good habits or bad habits. I need to be in control of them and I need to change them. Uh, I've developed the habit of writing lists. So I always have my phone in my hand and I'm not one of those people who are like anti-phones or you're at a dinner table. There's right. six people around you. Be social. Wrong. I have 18,000 followers on Twitter. I'm being social with 18,000 people at once. That's actually being social, especially when it's something that I can monetize in, in years to come right. with selling books or ads. But I always have my phone in my hand. I write lists. So I have three lists and I call it my uh, to-do list. Let's call it that. <laughs> it's, it's a slightly inappropriate name, but if you watched Pineapple Express, the movie, you would get the reference. <laughs> uh, But I have a list of things I need to do by morning time, by afternoon, and by evening. And I have alarms that are set on my phone every day. When that alarm goes off, I'm supposed to have everything on that list done. Everything that's not done at 11 a.m. goes on my afternoon list. And if it's not done by afternoon list, it goes to my evening list. If it's not by my evening list, before I go to bed, I rewrite everything on the whiteboard next to my bed. And I move everything that I haven't done to my morning. Mm. And no one wants to do the last things on their list from yesterday, the first thing in the morning. So I make sure I do everything that I don't want to leave for tomorrow. The least desirable things is I, I do them first. Yeah, yeah. And there's a little shot of endorphins that, that your body releases every time you get something done. And I, I put little check marks next to it, whether it's check the mail or uh, cut your toenails. There's so many things on my list. And I put a little little American flag emoji next to it. Mm. And at the end of the day, when I get to erase everything that I've done off my list, I feel accomplished. I can look back at an entire day and say, look at all the things I've done. It was a productive day. Or I can look back and say, I wasted today and I'll never get it back. Let's make up for it tomorrow. 
I mean, what I love about this is just, I mean, you're living life intentionally with intent. I mean, you are being thoughtful about your time down to alarms. And while, you know, I'm known with some productivity research, I talk about, you know, scheduling your life instead of listing. But even though you're listing, <laughs> you're putting them into the time slots, at least the three big buckets of morning, afternoon uh, and night and really being thoughtful about, you know, what you're going to get done in each of these in each of these zones. Yeah. Another thing I do is uh, I and even before our podcast, we had a little chat. I wrote down everything you said. I keep a I have a, a section on my notes under my phone uh, meeting with and Kevin and everything that you told me to do. Right. I'll put it on the list. When I met Devin Henderson for coffee, everything he told me, I wrote it down as he said it. And I refused to meet with the person a second time unless I get everything on that list done because I don't want to ask you the same question twice or waste your time because I do not want anyone wasting my time. Almost every high achiever that I've ever met uses a notebook, whether paper or digital. Uh, you know, that's one of Richard Branson's big things. He's saying his little paper notebook is how he built Virgin because everything gets written down. And um, I, in fact, I uh, interviewed Tom Ziegler, who's Zig Ziegler's son. And we were talking same kind of thing, just talking shop and about how we love, you know, filling in our notebooks and making lists and notes every call, every meeting. I'm the same way. And he, you know, he schooled me though, Kim. He said that like I was kind of just jotting little short notes about things so I wouldn't forget. And he said, you know, he's like, Kevin, your notebook is your legacy. Like you, your kids or other people are going to find these someday when you're gone. Like he encouraged me to like go even deeper with it. Like when you read a book, write down like the lessons that you got from a book or like lessons that you learned today. He's like, you shouldn't just be writing notes for yourself, write notes for like the future generation. And that really blew my mind. And I can't say I'm doing it yet to that degree, but I mean, that's how deep he was into taking notes. Oh yeah. And make it a habit. Yeah. Make it a habit. Right. Be conscious of everything you're doing. And I, I think that's where a lot of people fall short because they aren't conscious of what they're doing. And justification of, of your own BS. <laughs> right. I think moderation is justification of bad habits. Yeah, that's great. That's a great line. If you ever say I only, whatever you say after I only is you justifying something you shouldn't be doing. Right, right. I only have a cigarette when I drink. Well, those two <laughs> things you shouldn't be doing. <laughs> Yeah, I won't admit on 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 air all the my onlys, but they're more mainly food <laughs> food related. Back to that ten percent Super Bowl diet. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I only eat like this on weekends. Yeah, right. I only drink a six pack when the game is on. <laughs> yeah, and I have the ESPN package, so there's always a game on. Exactly, there's always a game on. So this is a lot of fun, but Cam, we need to wrap up. But before we do, you know, I always challenge our listeners. I say get at least 1% better every single day. Get a little better. And you've already given us some, some great value bombs here. But I'm going to ask you for one more. Like, challenge us. What can we do today to become a little more awesome? I would say whatever your goal is, set it bigger and fail on a big stage. Make it public so you're holding yourself accountable for it and don't be embarrassed after you failed. If you can fail without being discouraged, success becomes inevitable. I love it. I just wrote that down as you were saying it. I love that. You know, fail without being discouraged. Uh, I like to say there's only two options. You win or you learn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Failure is not an option. So, Cam, thanks again for coming on the show. And how can our listeners find out more about you and what you're up to? Well, luckily, I'm not famous enough for anyone to steal my name. So I have the same <laughs> handle on everything at Cam F. Awesome, C A M F A W E S O M E. On Twitter, Instagram, uh, Snapchat, Facebook, LinkedIn, I'm Cam F. Awesome. And if anybody ever has any questions, I always respond. Love that. Very generous. All right, friends, you've just been mentored by heavyweight boxer, comedian, keynote speaker, Cam F. Awesome. Don't forget you can get the links and notes from this interview over at leadx.org. And while that's it for today's episode of the LeadX Show, don't forget you can download our free ebook, Richard Branson's Seven Secrets to Leadership, over at leadx.org forward slash Branson. And until next time, remember, leadership is not a choice. You're a leader whether you want to be or not, because leadership is all about influence. You influence those around you with your words and your silence, your actions, and when you choose to be a bystander. We are all leaders. Today, lead with intent.